It's a pleasure to be here in uh, Lakhav. As you can probably tell, I'm originally from India, but this is my first visit to Lakhav. So very glad to be here, and thank you for inviting me. So the title of my talk is Evolution of Data Center Network Architecture. So this is going to be a little bit more of a technical talk than uh, the previous uh, two. Um, a little bit about the university. The university is named for George Washington, the first president of the U.S., and that's a statue of, of George Washington. That's, you'll find several statues of him all around campus if you came to the campus. So my uh, area of uh, expertise is uh, networking, and this talk is about uh, data center uh, networking. So many of you probably heard about data centers if you have not really done any work on data centers. So what are data centers? So this is closely related with cloud computing, another very popular term that you may have heard of. So what is cloud computing and what are data centers? So cloud computing is basically large-scale computing that offers some kind of a service, which is called as XAAS. So the X can be either infrastructure, IAS, platform, PAS, and software, SAS. I mean, there are lots of examples of these kinds of services. Google <coughs> Apps, Amazon EC2, etc. So data centers, how are they related to cloud computing? Data centers are basically massive sets of commodity. Commodity means off the shelf that you can just buy. Compute and storage elements that are interconnected through a network in order to enable cloud services. So to provide these, oops, so to provide these services, you need a lot of computation, and the data centers are the basically the workhorses of the internet. They provide the power to do this computation. Right? And the data center network is the network that connects these compute and storage elements. So you have a lot of memory, you have a lot of servers, or computers, and they must all be interconnected for them to do the work, all of this data processing together. So this talk is going to focus on how to build or how to architect a data center network that can scale to very large sizes. So this is an example of a very small part of one of Google's data centers. So this is what it looks like. And there are, sorry. So there would be lots of rows of these types of these types of racks here. So this is a rack, a single rack, and each one of these rows is a server. You just plug in a blade server, that's what it's called. So each rack contains some 30 odd servers, and there are lots of racks, as you can see, in one aisle, and there are probably hundreds of such aisles in a big data center location. Okay. So that's how much compute power exists in a single data center. Right? So the traffic inside data centers is growing, and this is uh, this uh, chart is a little bit dated, actually. But the point is that the traffic is continuing to grow in an almost exponential manner within data centers. Okay. So by one estimate, Intel says that the connectivity industry within data centers is estimated to be over 11 billion plus. So what I'm going to talk about today is how to architect very large-scale data centers, so-called hyperscale data centers. Currently, there are about 500 such data centers in the world, and the usual suspects dominate this industry. So you see the top uh, companies here, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, IBM. These run some of the world's biggest data centers. And there's also the three big companies in China, Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu. And there are a lot of other data centers uh, around the world. So these are, these are the really large uh, companies that run data centers with hundreds of thousands of machines that are independent. So Amazon is one of the biggest, probably the world's biggest data center. Uh, it by itself has about 100 data center sites around the world, and about 38 are in the Washington DC region, which is where I'm from, actually not very far from my home, is Washington Dallas Airport, where there are very, very large buildings consisting of a lot of these data centers. They are so large that and they consume so much power that they have their own power plants on site. So they generate their own electricity to run the cooling, all of that stuff. So a typical data center <coughs> consumes about 15 megawatts of power. And that's, just, that's a lot of power. And that's an average data center. So one of these big data centers consumes a lot more power than that. So to, to cool the machines, we generate a lot of heat. In the processing, <coughs> but even your computer generates a lot of heat, and you have to have a fan inside. So you can imagine if something is consuming 15 megawatts of power, it must generate a lot of heat. So just the cooling takes a lot of power. 
So here are some of the requirements for a data center. Right? So the data center needs to scale modularly. So if somebody starts out by building a smaller data center, then you know, five years from now, I should be able to expand my data center by buying more machines and making my data center bigger, rather than just throwing away everything I have and starting from scratch. So it must be scalable modularly to hundreds of thousands of servers, servers or computers. It must provide high throughput, which means very quick transfer, high bandwidth, you can say, and low latency, which means low delay for arbitrary traffic patterns. Okay. So an important application used by data centers is so-called OLDI applications, or online data inter intensive applications, an example being web search. Okay. So these require very small delays. So Google did a study saying that if the delay for a web search increases by a few milliseconds to 50 milliseconds, by 50 milliseconds, then they estimated that they could lose tens of millions, millions of dollars of revenue. So that's how important latency is. And we experience that. When we do a search, if the search results don't come back immediately, immediately close the browser or you know, start a new search. Right? You don't finish that search. Right? So this is very important <coughs> for companies like uh, Google. So the network has to be very agile. That means it needs to be able to adapt to where the traffic exists, to be able to serve the traffic. Uh, fault tolerance is very important because of the sheer number of components that the data center has. There are hundreds of thousands of machines, so its failure of some machine is the norm rather than the exception. It must have low power consumption, as low as possible for the, for the size that it has, low complexity, and low cost. So currently, this is the cost breakdown of, of, of data centers. So the servers, the machines themselves, cost about 45%. So almost half of the cost of the data center is in the <coughs> machines. And the rest of the infrastructure, this is the buildings and so on, that's 25%. Electricity is 15%, and the network is 15%. OK, so I'm going to focus just on the network part of the data center. So we have all of these machines that need to be interconnected to each other through a network. So this is the conventional architecture for a data center. So we have the servers at the bottom right here. The servers, as I said, are arranged in a rack. Right? So, so, and the servers within the rack can communicate with each other through a switch at the top called as the top of the rack switch. That's what it's called, top, top of the rack. Okay? So there's a switch literally sitting at the top of, of each of those racks. But these racks then need to be connected to each other, and that is done in a hierarchical manner through switches and routers. And the routers here connect to the larger internet. Okay. Now, one of the interesting things about data center traffic is that the traffic that comes from outside the internet, for example, a web search, and that's going to be coming through here, that traffic is a very small portion of the traffic that's, that exists within the, data, within the data center. Most of the traffic that exists that is generated within the data center, that is within these servers, are actually intended for some other server within the, within the data center. It's not intended to be delivered to the user, but to do that web search, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And that's, that's, that all happens here. OK, so there were a number of problems identified with, that, with this architecture. Uh, the, uh, the bandwidth for these links turned out to be too high. The switches at the top had to be very expensive right here. So there were a lot of problems associated with this architecture. So there was interest in developing new architectures that can be scaled to thousands of servers, tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of servers. Okay. So one of the uh, most popular ones was uh, published, was presented in a paper about uh, 12 years ago in this conference called SICCOM. It's called as uh, flat fat tree, and basically this is how the fat tree uh, architecture looks. It's also called as the leaf spine architecture. So you have a, these servers are right here at the bottom, and you have multiple levels of switches, and these are typically optical links, and the top of the rack switches are are here. So let me show you a schematic diagram of this uh, fat tree. So this is what it looks like. So you have the machines or the racks right here at the bottom, and they're connected in this in this manner through multiple switches, and I won't go into the details of this particular architecture, but the attractive feature of this architecture is that all of these switches are identical 
and they are commodity switches. You can get a 48 port Ethernet switch that's commercially available and build a data center network with those kinds of switches, right? And they showed that with the 48 port Ethernet switch, this network can scale to almost 28,000 servers. And there's also a lot of paths to communicate between any two servers. If you take this server and this server, for example, there are multiple paths connecting this and this. For example, there are two switches here in this example, and there are two switches here. Each one of them is a distinct path. So there are four paths, four distinct paths. This is a simple example network with just 16, 16 servers. But when you have a lot of servers, 27,000 servers, there are over 500 paths between any two pair of servers. That means there's a lot of ways to read out traffic around any congestion with that network. Right? So all these conventional data center architectures used typically electronics. Okay? But electronics have a limit. Okay? So scaling it up to very high data rates makes it extremely expensive. There's another technology that's available that's heavily used in telecommunications, which is optical transmission. So optical transmission, you can transmit orders of magnitude higher than you can transmit through electronic means. So in optical transmission, you basically take a laser and modulate that with the data. And then you transmit it over an optical fiber. That's how optical transmission works. The data rates are the order of terabits per second, which is extremely high. So that actually needs to be broken down into smaller pieces in order to be able to effectively use it because there is no source that can transmit at terabits per second. So you need to bring it down to gigabits per second and combine many of these sources together to transmit over a fiber. So that's what is done in practice. So they use a technique called wavelength division multiplexing in order to do this. So the bandwidth of a fiber is divided into multiple wavelengths, multiple channels or multiple wavelengths, and you use each wavelength at 100 gigabits per second, let's say. Okay. And there are about 100 wavelengths or 200 wavelengths in each fiber. So giving you a total of multiple terabits per second. So we have this transmission medium that provides this extremely high bandwidth. Could we use that in data centers? Okay. So that is the big question that everybody started asking. And here are some of the architectures that were presented. I'm just going to go through a couple of them. One of them is this, a simple one, and the other one is our own architecture that we are currently developing. So the way optical uh, transmission works, and optical transmission and optical switching works, is very different from how electrical switching works. So if you've taken a networks class, how many of you have taken a networks class here, the students? OK, so very few have taken a networks class. So the way you communicate using electrical communication is that you transmit a packet, which is a bunch of bits. And then you transmit the packet to the first switch. The switch is going to receive the packet, and then it's going to send the packet to the next switch, and so on, until the packet reaches the destination. So that's how electrical packet switching works. In optics, that's not possible, because it's not possible to store light. Okay? So there's no optical memories. You cannot store a packet of light and then send it to another switch, and so on. So the only way is you have to do something called a circuit switching, where you transmit something, and the signal goes all the way to the very end without without being switched, uh, stored, and forwarded at intermediate points. Okay. So this illustrates the differences between these two technologies, store and forward and circuit switching. And the switching capacity is another. So this, is, this illustrates how optical switching is done. This is a so-called MEMS optical switch, microelectromechanical system. And it basically uses, oops, basically uses an array of mirrors and this is input light. And by orienting these mirrors, by tilting these mirrors, you can send the input light to whichever output port you want. So that's how you accomplish switching in, in optics here. Okay. So the difference in switching capacity is, is huge between the liberty pack switching and optical, optical switching. So you can look at that. You can look at the differences right here. So optical switching is much more, uh, much higher switching capacity. On the other hand, the switching time, how quickly can you change the switch? So if I want to send something in this direction to this port, another time I want to send something there. Okay. An electrical switch can be configured at packet granularity, which means in the order of nanoseconds or microseconds. Whereas an optical switch, it takes about 10 milliseconds, which is many orders of magnitude slower than an electronic switch. Okay. So the pros and cons of optics. 
It has very high capacity. Okay, as I already mentioned, you have 160 wavelengths with up to 40 or 100 gigabits per second each. Okay. And there are a lot of low power consuming optical components that are available that I will talk about in just a moment that could be used and reduce the power consumption of data centers. And it's also agnostic to data rate and format. In other words, once you send something over light, the intermediate nodes don't even look at what format the signal is at. Okay? So it's only the end nodes that have to know what format the signal is at. So which means you could have multiple formats being transmitted over the same fiber, and the intermediate switches don't care. Whereas that's not the case in, in electronic packet switching. Okay? The, Cons or the disadvantage are very slow switching speeds, as I mentioned, relatively speaking. Okay. The technology is relatively expensive, but the prices are continuing to drop, and the technology is somewhat rudimentary. For example, there's no optical memory, and there are a lot of things that you can do in electronics that cannot be done in optics. Okay. So the question then is, how do we take the advantage that optics provides and mitigate the problems or you know, overcome the disadvantages of optics to provide and combine it with electronics to pr provide the features that you need in a data center network. Right? So see-through is one of the uh, first architectures that combine this optics with electronics. So on top here is your regular data center network, your electrical packet switch network. So what they did was they augmented that network with a single optical switch right here. So single optical switch and so that's the that's the electrical packet switch network at the top for low latency delivery and optical circuit switch network for high capacity transfer. So if, there's, if there are some pairs of racks which have a lot of traffic, terabits per second worth of traffic going between them, then it's better to send it to the optical network. So, that was it. so you identify which pair of racks have high traffic and switch those high traffic flows to the optical network and the electrical network will handle the low traffic part of it, no right? So that, and this switch is reconfigurable. You can change which racks are connected, but somewhat slowly, not for every rack. Okay. So I don't know how I'm doing on time. Yes. I'm doing OK? OK, so this is our architecture. And I'm going to introduce a few optical components. Mm -hmm. So as I said, one of my main areas of research is optical networking. And optical networking is somewhat of a niche area. Not too many people, even within networking, know about optical uh, components. So I'm going to introduce uh, you to some of them. So here is our goal. So we started with the goal of say, scaling up the network to millions of servers with an access rate, NIC is network interface card. So each computer here, each machine, has a network interface card. And right now, it's usually 1 gigabit per second, but it's increasing to 10 gigabits per second. So we assume 10 gigabits per second for each server. And we want to interconnect tens of millions of servers, or millions of servers at least. Okay. So that's the goal. How do we do that? And using as many low power optical components as possible. Because that's important because we want to keep the power consumption low. Okay. So here's the observation in data centers. And this is not our observation. This is the observation from the people that operate these data centers, Microsoft, Google, and so on. That the traffic in data centers is typically this hotspots. There is one rack which is generating a lot of traffic, or there is one rack which is consuming a lot of traffic, to which a lot of traffic is going. But it's not completely uniform. It's not any rack can communicate with anything at all the times. It's not like that. So the traffic is kind of focused. Okay. So can we take advantage of this observation and try to adapt the network, configure the network to suit a particular traffic pattern? Obviously, the traffic can change from one time to another. So we need to be able to reconfigure when the traffic changes. So is it possible to provide these kinds of uh, capabilities to the network? So here are some of the optical components that uh, this architecture uses. And I'm just going to give a very high level overview of what these components do. The first one is called as an optical coupler. It's a very simple device. Two input ports, two output ports. All it does is combine the power of the two signals from the two inputs and this it adds the power of the two signals and distributes it to the two outputs. Okay? So simply, it's, it adds these two signals and distributes them equally to, to these two outputs. Now, what it can do is that if these two signals are in different wavelengths, then basically you've got a simple broadcast switch. 
you're adding things together and you're distributing it to the two outputs. Okay? Now this is called as a circulator, which is a three-port device. It's a directional device. So what you send in A comes out to A here, but it doesn't go to this other port. And what you send here comes out to this port, but not to this port. And what you send in here comes out to this port, but not to this port. So it's got this directional property. So this is a component that turns out to be useful to implement bidirectional transmission over a single fiber, as it turns out. Okay. So this is one of the most important components. So in optical transmission, in optical switching, you know, in conventional packet switching, what you do is you put a header in the packet saying where the packet should go. And the switches and the routers are going to look at the packet header and say, OK, if this has got an IP address of 128.64.78.23, and then it looks up a table and decides where this packet needs to be transmitted. So you cannot do such sophisticated processing in optics because there is no such capability yet. Right? You cannot code headers and packets and so on. So, but how do you do switching then? The only kind of uh, switching that's possible in optical switching is by using the wavelength that you transmit on. So there is a device that can switch based on the wavelength. So that switch is called as the wavelength selective switch. So here's a, a fiber which has these eight wavelengths here, different colors. And you can program the switch so that the red wavelength comes out on this port, and the green comes out here, the blue comes out here, and the other wavelengths are suppressed. And similarly, the, the orange and uh, this green comes out here, yellow comes here, and so on. So you can program the switch to send these different wavelengths to these different output ports, and, so, and you change the program. So at a later time, you can reprogram it to switch in different ways. So basically, you're using the wavelength as the address of the packet. Okay, so there's not a packet here, it's a signal, but you're using the wavelength as the address. Right? By changing the wavelength, you can decide where, 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 which output you want the signal to go to, or you can also reprogram the switch. There are two ways <coughs> which you can do that. So this is a passive switch, actually. This is an AWGR, Array Waveguide Grading uh, Router. This is less powerful than the previous one. So in the previous one, you can program the switch. Here, you cannot program the switch. So the only way to send a wavelength to a desired output is by changing the wavelength. By, 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 by to send a signal to a desired output is by changing the wavelength. So here, lambda 1 to lambda 8, these are eight wavelengths. So the switch is a fixed switch. So lambda 1 and lambda 5 from here are going to be switched to this output, lambda 2 to lambda 6 here, and so on. So this is the switching matrix that shows you which wavelength on which input is going to be switched to which output. And this switch cannot be changed. This is manufactured fixed. There are no active components here. It consumes zero power. Okay. So the only way you can change where you want the signal to appear is by tuning your transmitter, tuning your laser. So your transmitter lambda 1 here, the signal will appear here. If you transmit on lambda 3, the signal is going to appear here. Okay? So by sending it to different output ports, you're basically sending it to a different rack, right? if you put this in a data center. Okay. So this is a passive device that does not consume any power. So it's desirable to use this because it's not going to heat up, it's, it doesn't consume any power, but how can you use this effectively in a data center? So this is our architecture, and I won't go into the details of this architecture. It's fairly uh, complex. But what I'll say is that the, archi the architecture is a hierarchical architecture. So we have lots of racks, potentially millions of them. We group these racks into clusters. And a cluster is defined as by uh, having high mutual traffic between the various racks. So if there's a lot of traffic between the racks, we call it a cluster. Obviously, the clusters will change from time to time. And you must provide the ability to reconfigure these clusters sometimes. Right? And that's what the architecture provides. And the cluster membership is uh, reconfigurable. And then there's communication between the racks of the cluster and between racks of different clusters. So we call it intra-cluster communication and inter-cluster communication. So intra-cluster communication is going to be a high bandwidth network because you're putting two racks in a cluster because there's a lot of traffic between those clusters. Otherwise, they will not be in the same cluster. Right? Inter-cluster network is a, going to be a lower bandwidth network. Obviously, ideally, we'll provide a high bandwidth network for everybody, but that's not possible when you have millions of servers. 
So we group them into clusters and provide high bandwidth within the cluster, lower bandwidth between clusters. Okay, so this is how this, this part highlights how cluster membership is, uh, cluster is reconfigurable. So I won't go into the details of this one. And this is the intra-cluster network. So the AWGR that I showed you earlier, the passive switch, is what we use for the intra-cluster network. Okay? This is a switch. You can change which, which of the inputs and outputs are connected by choosing what wavelengths you're going to transfer to the inputs. And this is the inter-cluster network. Okay, so this uses, this uses the wavelength selective switch right here uh, to, to do its job. How do you interconnect one cluster with another cluster? So I, I won't go into the details of that, but it's just, let me just show you an example of how this works. Suppose this is a, a simple example with 12 racks and 12 racks here, and this is the amount of traffic. And the numbers here are <coughs> the amount of traffic in some unit, for example, in tens of gigabits per second. Okay. So this is what we are given, and our clustering algorithm has decided that these four clusters, these, sorry, these four racks are going to be in one cluster, these four are going to be in another cluster, R5 to R8, and R9 to R12 are going to be in cluster 3. That's C1, C2, and C3. Right? So you've got three clusters, and you've got these tracking. And this shows that this is how you, you configure the cluster switch to realize these clustering, this clustering that I just gave you. So we have these three clusters now, right? C1, C2, and C3, and this is the traffic within the cluster. We have four racks, R1 to R4, R5 to R8, and R9 to R12. Those are the three clusters, and this is the traffic within them. Now we run an optimization algorithm to optimize the topology of each cluster. How should each cluster look like? Okay. Which racks should be connected to each other, and which racks should not be connected to each other, right? So this is what we came up with. This is the top in our topology for the cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three. The I and O represent the ports for outgoing traffic and incoming traffic. Okay. For O and I, I should say, for outgoing and incoming traffic to outside the cluster and coming into the cluster, right? So now you have these three clusters, and this is how the inter-cluster topology looks like. This is C1, C2, and C3, and they have to be connected. Otherwise, you cannot go from you know, a rack here to a rack here. There must be a way to, to get to a rack in the other clusters as well, right? So that's what the, so putting everything together, this is what it looks like. This is cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three, and this is the inter-cluster topology. So they're connected in this map. <coughs> so how does this work? So if I take uh, a particular path, for example, R3 to R11, right? R3, R3 is here, and R11 is right there. So using the topologies that we have formed, this would be the path taken by a, a packet or a signal from R3 to R11. So it would go like this, and it would go along this path to this cluster, and then get routed to this cluster 3, and then go from there to here. So that's the path that it would, it would follow. Okay. Okay. So this is the entire topology. So let me just show you some results for the uh, architecture. So we conducted some uh, simulations to look at how different architectures perform. I did not show the other architectures, but this is just, uh, these are the other architectures that we're comparing with OSA, Factory, Wave Q. I showed you what the Factory is, but I did not show you what these are. And what is shown on the y-axis here is the number of hops. That is, how many times do you have to go and convert from optics to electronics and do a switching there? So that it turns actually it turns out that that dominates the latency, okay. because the in optics there is the latency is very low because you're you're not stopping anywhere in between right? circuit switching you're going end to end. So if you look at that and this for, we used a traffic trace provided by Facebook, and the number of hops is much smaller for our architecture order compared to the compared to the other architectures. So that essentially means the delay is going to be very small. So we also looked at the power and the cost for the various architectures, and these are the various components used by the various uh, you know, network architectures, and these are the number of such components, and the cost and power, and this is a plot that shows the power and dollar cost comparison as a function of the number of racks. So as, you, as the number of racks increases, both the power consumption and the cost 
they increase it. Look at the prices here. This is billions of dollars. This is not counting cooling and any other. This is just the you know machines and network. This is just for that. So the, our architecture is, uh, is lowermost here. So okay, so I'll, I'll switch this. I, I'll skip this. Sorry. So this shows how scalable our architecture is, and it shows that uh, our architecture can scale up to 30 million servers. But when you take the number of wavelengths into account, if there are about 100, 100 wavelengths, then you can scale up to 10 million, 10 million servers. So we find that this is uh, quite scalable. So final thoughts. So connectivity is very important in data centers, and the sizes of these data centers are continuing to grow. And architectures based on electrical packet switching don't scale well. Optical switching has its limitations, but seems to be the only solution that can provide the bandwidths that are needed for data centers. So how do you combine optical circuit switching with electrical packet switching is key. So software-defined networking is something that is a concept that can help make the network agile. So where is this going in the future? So I, I don't know if you've heard the term edge computing. Some of you may have heard about it. So edge computing is kind of the opposite of cloud computing. So cloud computing, you send everything to a cloud, and you get the process, and you get the results back. Edge computing is you're, you're not sending anything to the cloud, but you're sending it to a cloudlet or a small cloud maybe, that is much closer to the user. And these cloudlets could be very close to the user. For example, if you are uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you have a smartphone, a, a, an access point here could be a cloudlet. So you do some processing right there, so the delay is very low. You don't have to send it to a Google server to get it. Right? So this is going to happen for sure. So what's the future? Many edge data centers with a few giant data centers is probably what's, what we can expect to see in the future. So finally, I want to thank my students who did uh, the work, Ma Tang Su and Min Tian, and a couple of my collaborators, Eitan Moriano at MIT, and Elena Diakonikolas at UC Berkeley. And thanks to NSF for sponsoring this. Thank you. Yes. This is a component that turns out to be useful to implement bidirectional transmission over a single fiber, as it turns out. Okay. So this is one of the most important components. So in optical transmission, in optical switching, you know, in conventional packet switching, what you do is you put a header in the packet saying where the packet should go. And the switches and the routers are going to look at the packet header and say, OK, if this has got an IP address of 128.64.78.23, and then it looks up a table and decides where this packet needs to be transmitted. So you cannot do such sophisticated processing in optics because there is no such capability yet. Right? You cannot code headers and packets and so on. So, but how do you do switching then? The only kind of uh, switching that's possible in optical switching is by using the wavelength that you transmit on. So there is a device that can switch based on the wavelength. So that switch is called as the wavelength selective switch. So here's a, a fiber which has these eight wavelengths here, different colors. And you can program the switch so that the red wavelength comes out on this port, and the green comes out here, the blue comes out here, and the other wavelengths are suppressed. And similarly, the, the orange and uh, this green comes out here, yellow comes here, and so on. So you can program the switch to send these different wavelengths to these different output ports, and, so, and you change the program. So at a later time, you can reprogram it to switch in different ways. So basically, you're using the wavelength as the address of the packet. The extractor is not a packet here. It's a signal, but you're using the wavelength as the address. Right? By changing the wavelength, you can decide where, 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 which output you want the signal to go to, or you can also reprogram the switch. So there are two ways which you can do that. So this is a passive switch. This is an AWGR, a Rain Waveguide Grading uh, Router. This is less powerful than the previous one. So in the previous one, you can program the switch. Here, you cannot program the switch. So the only way to send a wavelength to a desired output is by changing the wavelength. By, 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 by to send a signal to a desired output is by changing the wavelength. So here, lambda 1 to lambda 8, these are eight wavelengths. 
So the switch is a fixed switch. So lambda 1 and lambda 5 from here are going to be switched to this output, lambda 2 to lambda 6 here, and so on. So this is the switching matrix that shows you which way loop on which input is going to be switched to which output. And this switch cannot be changed. This is manufactured fixed. There are no active components here. It consumes zero power. Okay. So the only way you can change where you want the signal to appear is by tuning your transmitter, tuning your laser. So your transmit on lambda 1 here, the signal will appear here. If you transmit on lambda 3, the signal is going to appear here. Okay. So by sending it to different output ports, you're basically sending it to a different rack, right? if you put this in a data center. Okay. So this is a passive device that does not consume any power. So it's desirable to use this because it's not going to heat up, it's, it doesn't consume any power, but how can you use this effectively in a data center? So this is our architecture, and I won't go into the details of this architecture, it's fairly uh, complex. But what I'll say is that the, ar the architecture is a hierarchical architecture. So we have lots of racks, potentially millions of them. We group these racks into clusters. And a cluster is defined as by uh, having high mutual traffic between the various racks. So if there's a lot of traffic between the racks, we call it a cluster. Obviously the clusters will change from time to time, and you must provide the ability to reconfigure these clusters sometimes. Right? And that's what the architecture uh, provides. And the cluster membership is uh, reconfigurable, and then there's communication between the racks of a cluster and between racks of different clusters. We call it intra cluster communication and inter cluster communication. So, intra cluster communication is going to be a high bandwidth network because you're putting two racks in a cluster because there's a lot of traffic between those clusters. Otherwise, they will not be in the same cluster. Okay? Inter-cluster network is a, going to be a lower bandwidth network. Obviously, ideally, we will provide a high bandwidth network for everybody, but that's not possible when you have millions of servers. So we group them into clusters and provide high bandwidth within the cluster, lower bandwidth between clusters. Okay, so this is how this, this part highlights how cluster membership is. Uh, cluster is reconfigurable. So I won't go into the details of this one. And this is the intra-cluster network. So the AWGR that I showed you earlier, the passive switch, is what we use for the intra-cluster network. Okay? This is a switch. You can change which, which of the inputs and outputs are connected by choosing what wavelengths you're going to transmit the inputs. And this is the inter-cluster network. So this uses this uses the wavelength selector switch right here uh, to to do its job. How do you interconnect one cluster with another cluster? So I, w I won't go into the details of that, but it's just let me just show you an example of how this works. Suppose this is a a simple example with twelve racks and twelve racks here, and this is the amount of traffic and the numbers here represent <coughs> the amount of traffic in some unit, for example, in tens of gigabits per second. So this is what we are given, and our clustering algorithm has decided that these four clusters, these, sorry, these four racks are going to be in one cluster, these four are going to be in another cluster, R5 to R8, and R9 to R12 are going to be in cluster 3. That's C1, C2, and C3. Right? So you've got three clusters, and you've got these traffic. And this shows that this is how you, you configure the cluster switch to realize these clusters, this clustering that I just gave you. So we have these three clusters now, right? C1, C2, and C3, and this is the traffic within the cluster. We have four racks, R1 to R4, R5 to R8, and R9 to R12. Those are the three clusters, and this is the traffic within them. Now we run an optimization algorithm to optimize the topology of each cluster. How should each cluster look like? Okay. Which racks should be connected to each other, and which racks should not be connected to each other, right? So this is what we came up with. This is the in our topology for the cluster 1, cluster 2, and cluster 3. The I and O represent the ports for outgoing traffic and incoming traffic. Okay. For o and I, I should say, for outgoing and incoming traffic to outside the cluster and coming into the cluster. Right? So now you have these three clusters, and this is how the inter-cluster topology looks like. This is C1, C2, and C3, and they have to be connected. Otherwise, you cannot go from you know, a rack here to a rack here. There must be a way to, to get to a rack in the other clusters as well, right? So that's what the, so putting everything together, this is what it looks like. This is cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three, and this is the inter-cluster 
the bottom. So they're connected in this map. <coughs> so how does this work? So if I take uh, a particular path, for example, R3 to R11, right? R3, R3 is here, and R11 is right there. Okay? So using the topologies that we have formed, this would be the path taken by a, a packet or signal from R3 to R11. So it would go like this, and it would go along this path to this cluster, and then get routed to this cluster 3, and then go from there to here. So that's the path that it would, it would follow. Okay. Okay, so this is the entire topology. So let me just show you some results for the uh, architecture. So we conducted some uh, simulations to look at how different architectures perform. I did not show the other architectures, but this is just uh, these are the other architectures that we're comparing with like OSA, Factory, Wave Q. I showed you what the factory is, but I did not show you what these are. And what is shown on the y-axis here is the number of hops. That is, how many times do you have to go and convert from optics to electronics and do a switching there? So that it turns actually it turns out that that dominates the latency okay. because the in optics there is the latency is very low because you're, you're not stopping anywhere in between circuit so switching you're going end to end. So if you look at that and this for, we used a traffic trace provided by Facebook and the number of hops is much smaller for our architecture order compared to the compared to the other architecture. So that essentially means the delay is going to be very small. So we also looked at the power and the cost for the various architectures, and these are the various components used by the various uh, you know, network architectures, and these are the number of such components, and the cost and power, and this is a plot that shows the power and dollar cost comparison as a function of the number of racks. So as, you, as the number of racks increases, both the power consumption and the cost increases. Look at the prices here. This is billions of dollars. This is not counting cooling and any other. This is just the you know, machines and network. This is just the network part, right? So the, our architecture is, uh, is lowermost here. So, okay, so I, I'll switch this. I, I'll skip this, sorry. So this shows how scalable our architecture is, and it shows that uh, our architecture can scale to 30 million servers, but when you take the number of wavelengths into account, if there are about 100, 100 wavelengths, then you can scale up to 10 million. 10 million servers. So we'll find that this is uh, quite scalable. So final thoughts. So connectivity is very important in data centers, and the sizes of these data centers are continuing to grow. And architectures based on electrical packet switching don't scale well. Optical switching has its limitations, but seems to be the only solution that can provide the bandwidths that are needed for data centers. So how do you combine optical circuit switching with electrical packet switching is key. So software-defined networking is something that is a concept that can help make the network agile. So where is this going in the future? So I, I don't know if you've heard the term edge computing. Some of you may have heard about it. So edge computing is kind of the opposite of cloud computing. So cloud computing, you send everything to a cloud, and you get the process, and you get the results back. Edge computing is you're, you're not sending anything to the cloud, but you're sending it to a cloudlet or a small cloud maybe, that is much closer to the user. And these cloudlets could be very close to the user. For example, if, you're, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you have a smartphone, a, a, an access point here could be a cloudlet. So you do some processing right there, so the delay is very low. You don't have to send it to a Google server to get it. Right? So this is going to happen for sure. So what's the future? Many edge data centers with a few giant data centers is probably what's, what we can expect to see in the future. Right? So finally, I want to thank my students who did most uh, of the work, Maotown Su and Min Tian, and a couple of my collaborators, Eitan Moriano at MIT, and Elena Diakon Nicholas at UC Berkeley, and thanks to NSF for sponsoring this. Thank you very much.